so yes, yeah, so I'm down, and uh, you'll see, you'll notice, of course, that just like every company at the holidays, most of us aren't here. <laughs> uh, everybody's out. Tara's out on vacation. Uh, Eric's out on vacation. Uh, Erica is out on vacation, out uh, walking Ernie somewhere. I was surprised you actually did the office hours today. I thought we were going to. Uh, uh, uh. You know, I normally, if I'd have thought, if I'd have had my brain on, I actually had this whole day blocked out as available for calls, and so I had a couple of sales calls booked, and then I had to email back people and go, I'm sorry, this is, I can't do this. <laughs> it's like, it's off. Uh, what was your prop pain guy? I don't, like, Oracle? What? I, I'm not quite sure what we're, what, what I'm, sorry. Well, and, and it's like I think as a consultant, as a, when you go like independent freelancer kind of thing, there's almost no such thing as holidays. You're like, I don't know what day it is. I'm just going to work. When you don't have kids and stuff like that. That's, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but no, after Christmas, this is very different. This is The brain just switches off for a while. Yeah, you know, I'm, um, I, I kind of teach this job, treat this job a little bit like a – you know, entrepreneur type thing, because I think we kind of yeah. all are a bit, yeah. you know, so, you know, after the kids get back, usually about 5.30, you know, the wife starts pop popping in, it's like, uh, um, <laughs> and then um, usually that till about 9, 10 o'clock, that's when usually, the kids are usually out, and then, you know, the wife usually gets knocked out by 10, and then I'm like, ooh, I'm awake, what can I do, right, yeah. so... That's when a lot of other stuff gets done too. I was reading an article about yesterday about mind altering, like uh, the equivalent of caffeine for your brain, but you know things that uh, wire you up and help you miss sleep. Um, not because I want to. I have no interest. I love sleep. Sleep's fantastic. It's great. I love it. Like if I could do it more, I probably would. Um, but just out of curiosity, like how uh, high-end programmers like hack their brains, people who are independent, like every app that they build, they go make money off of or whatever. So it's literally the less they can sleep, the more they can make. And reading what these people put their bodies through, I'm like, dude, you are going to regret that in like 10 yeah. years. Yeah, I got a buddy of mine who does that. And he does all the, 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 the pills, natural, some unnatural, that type of thing. And he just he goes. He absolutely goes, and I'm like, I can't keep up with you. I'm so sorry. You the man, though. You the man. I you're can't the keep man up. now, but you know what's going to happen years from now when you find out of all the uh, all these side effects, or or and you don't, which maybe there's no side effects, in which case, okay, everybody's up on that level then. Um, but man, I don't. You remember how? I mean, we don't remember, but tobacco growing up, everybody's like, oh, doctors say it's great for your T zone, you know, and then. Oh, it causes cancer. Oh, wait. And that was huge. Everybody was smoking. Yeah. Well, I mean, not only that, but we used to buy candy cigarettes. I don't know if you remember that, Brent. Yes. So they were training us to to actually smoke when we're older. Hey, go ahead. Here, have some candy cigarettes, kids. You'll do this when you're about 14. Yeah. Yes, I, I have the same. This is going to sound really weird, but maybe you'll get it as a glasses person. I have the same thing with LASIK surgery. I have a bunch of friends who've done it and have been happy with it. You, Jeremiah Kendra did it, um, yeah. and I'm still that old fuddy-duddy who's like, you know what? I only have these two. I only have these two eyes, and that's all I got. And I don't really mind glasses, you know, even with bifocals or whatever. But if I mess these eyes up, I am in, in deep trouble. Yeah, I can't do the bifocals uh, because of the computer screening thingies. I guess I could buy a pair and walk mm -hmm. around with them, but you know, the transition from bifocals to not, I probably screw me up completely. Um, but yeah, I'm with you, man. I can't even do the cataract eye blowing in the eye thingy. I'm like, uh, you know, I'm good. I'm good, uh, bro. I'm good. Trust me. I'm not. You know, you're not getting no, 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 no. And I just, and I just went to the eye doctor a couple months ago, and yeah, they they tried to do it. I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Nope, nope. Next, what's Have the next? You ever, thing you want me to you ever tried to put your finger in your eye for contacts? Uh, I can't even. I can't even get close to that. No. Nope. Me do. Me do. No. Nope. I'm nope. so not ready. I tried repeatedly over the years. I'm like, oh, let me see if I'm ready. Nope. <laughs> nope. Well, I mean, without the glasses, I'm legally blind, right? So there, this is the, you know, when I was a kid, I had the Coke bottle, bottle glasses thingy thing. You know, now with the ultra high index, you don't have that problem anymore. But man, that, those were those were rough as a kid. You know, when you've got the big fixie, that's right. <laughs> You're like, what was that, the Thelma from Scooby Doo? Uh, yeah. 
my glasses go? Dude, my glasses are gone. It's hopeless. I got about eight feet of vision, and that's about it. Yeah, it's rough. Uh, you got more than I do. Uh, let's see. Fellow human says, transition lenses are the way to go. He means progressive lenses. Uh, you know, I've tried those, and I, I was down with that. Like, I, the idea, I'm 100% ready to embrace it. My problem was car rearview mirrors. When I glance down at the rearview mirror, it would be fuzzy, and I'm like, nope, that's this isn't going to work for me because I drive a lot, and I drive in ways that are uh, your officer friendly would not shine on. And so, wait, wait, that's that's all talk. I, I've heard the way Erica talks about your driving. That's all talk. Screams when I take her out in the R6 <laughs> and drive the way that I like to have fun. <laughs> My dad was like, I took him out of the RS6 because uh, I wanted to show him, hey, check this out. It's a really fun toy. And he's grabbing on to the side thing and to the glove box at the same time, like holding on. I'm like, Dad, we're not even turning yet. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen those videos where they take you know, the grandma or the ultra hot looking girl and they're at the passenger and all of a sudden they're like, ah! Yes. They're still what at a stop sign. Videos look like look for RS6, uh, like RS6 mom or RS6 passenger, and there's a bunch of people with Audi RS6s that take their moms out, and, and mom is just like, ah, f bob, f bob, f bob. And she says that we're both bats, and by that she means that we sleep upside down and we use radar. But yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I thought we saw we we took care of, we saw our families when we were in Austin, and we we saw all the bats there. Yeah. Or she maybe she was saying we had bats in the cave. All right, let's see what's up. Uh, is it about that time? Yeah, it is about that time. Let's see what we got here for questions. We have, uh, should I still be backing up system databases in an Azure VM? Oh, what a great question. I don't even know if you can. Oh, no, I'm thinking Azure SQL DB, of course, yeah. in Azure VMs. So I have this philosophy, philosophy, and it's also a philosophy, uh, that you back up data, not servers. There's a saying in the cloud, treat your servers like cattle, not like pets. Or as like Richie and I like to just not have any servers at all. We don't even like to have cattle. Not that we're vegetarians, we just don't like servers up in the cloud. No, it's not true. I'm, I'm generalizing just to joke here because I know I'm going to immediately get in trouble for saying that. Um, so my thing is if something hosed on your system databases, I don't want to take the time to try to recover that. I just want to fail over somewhere else. Maybe that somewhere else means I'm doing log shipping. Maybe it means I'm doing database mirroring. But generally, I don't want to put anything irreplaceable in the system databases, um, just in case if I lose those VMs. Let's see next up. Robert says, is there any advantage to setting min server memory? Most people set max server memory and then min server memory. There's kind of some fuzzy questions around. I've been a DBA a long time, me too, Robert, and we always leave it at zero with no issues. I realize SQL Server will ramp up to this amount, but do I get like a performance boost? So I'm in the same camp that you are, Robert. I, I just leave it at zero. I've never seen a, a problem that I've solved by setting min server memory. The problem with min server memory is SQL Server doesn't use all of it immediately. SQL Server gradually inches up its memory based on demands. So if you think you're going to lock down that RAM and nobody else can use it, that's not how min server memory works. I've seen people say, I want to make sure SQL Server always at least has this much. Well, I'm the kind of guy that if SQL Server is covering under memory pressure from something, it's like an app or something that's starting on the SQL Server and burning memory. I want to find out whenever SQL Server isn't using the max, that's usually my bigger concern, and then just immediately alert me on that so I can go track down what app is using that extra memory. But if the app wants to use extra memory, I'd rather have SQL Server up than have Windows crash due to an out-of-memory exception. So I'm kind of okay with leaving it at zero. If anybody has a, a, a problem where setting min server memory has actually fixed the problem, not like made the problem look like it's not there, but fixed the problem, I'd love to hear about it too. That'd be interesting. Because I'm always, I'm always like, there's, there's probably some exception to the rule. I just haven't hit it yet. There's got to be a reason why it's there, right? I see. That's one of those things I don't agree with. I, I hear people say that all the time from Microsoft. Man, there's features in that product that should never be there. <laughs> it's just a bad idea. 
priority boost was the one where it made sense a long, long time ago in weird situations. It should be out of the product now. Um, auto close and auto shrink, I get it in some ISV situations, but there's a lot of a lot of features that just shouldn't exist. So in, in other words, there's a reason why it's there. It just may not be a relevant current reason why it's there. Yeah. Just like Julie Citro says, uh, you can still buy candy cigarettes and cigars in some places. And that's true. It's kind of morphed now. Now it's an adult joke thing. Now it's like you get these candy cigarettes and you laugh about them because of how, what a bad childhood we all had. <laughs> uh, so, uh, fellow human says, long shot. Do you have any opinions on, we do, boy, do we have opinions. Oh, we could go for days on our opinions. Do you have any opinions on backup solutions, good or bad, from your clients, specifically net backup or SQL Server? Man, I've heard horror stories about everything. Uh, the first thing I thought, Longshot, I'm like, hey, that's a great X-Men character, Longshot. I really dug Longshot. Longshot was pretty cool. So what? that's such a good name immediately for a character. What was Longshot's, like, special power? Oh, gosh, I forget. Some energy thing or other. Um, but he, he was just kind of this cool character, always fought against Mojo, and and uh, it was kind of around. I, I remember when I was collecting as a kid, he was around, but he's not around anymore. And then I thought long shot, and I'm like, don't throw away your shot, because, you know, Hamilton's still in my head. So, and sorry, dude. There, there's something else I need I need to get, maybe a drill, a special Hamilton drill to get it all out. But. <laughs> Well, I listened to Adam Savage's podcast, and he was on Hamilton for like six months straight, listening to it on endless repeat, so you've got to yeah. waste it. Yeah, yeah, damn it. I would say, in terms of backup solutions, I've seen so many bad horror stories, even with native backups. I mean, I've just seen, it all comes down to the people and process. Do you have regular routines for checking your backups? The horror stories I hear around net backup usually are um, involve DBA saying it's out of my control and I don't know when it's going to run the backups, like that someone else is managing that for me now. Uh, that's a problem if you can't predict when they're going to happen, you don't know when they're going to rec recover to, and you don't know when your server is going to be under performance loads. So generally speaking, I like stuff like net backup, TSM, when it takes the backups away from the DBAs to let them focus on something that they love doing, and when the people who are taking over the backups have plenty of time on their hands and they can carefully craft, craft backup scenarios. Now, otherwise, I kind of just like backing up to a share, just back up to a file share, let the DBAs manage those backup schedules, and then back up the stuff off the file share. Uh, TempDB data files, Robert says. Is it always a good practice to turn off auto growth? Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a, one of the weird people who I like to set aside a volume for TempDB, just one volume for TempDB permanently. That's all it's going to be for. Because sooner or later, somebody's going to run it out of space, and I don't want it running the whole server out of space or like the OS drive or the user database files. I just like having a TempDB volume. It also usually has different I.O. patterns than the rest of my databases. Often I'll use local solid state for that. Um, so with this, I'll just go ahead and grow out the files to fill out that volume. So say that uh, I have 100 gigs of space on the volume, I'm just going to grow out my TempDB data files to fill it up. If you don't have that luxury, if you don't have the luxury of a separate volume just for TempDB, then you may have to leave AutoGrow on. Uh, someone says, I just had cataract surgery, now I don't need glasses, it's the best. Wow! So, I, you know what's funny? This is going to sound really weird. I always think of cataracts in terms of dogs, because I'm so used to being a pet owner and seeing dogs with cataracts. Woof. Uh, woof. Woof? Oh, woof. woof. Oh, woof. No, you're more of a cat guy. You're more of a cat guy. I'd expect me out. Yeah, asking. knowing that I don't have any dogs, nor I've had any dogs, and have six cats, yeah, that would be appropriate. But I was more referring to the way you see me, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, oh lovable pet. Drools on the couch sometimes. Yeah. 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 I occasionally leave a mess, especially in the cloud. <laughs> Unconditional love. Um, let's see, next question. Using a linked server... Uh, when I try to populate a temp table with the exec results, I get an error procedure, blah, 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 blah. Um, so what you want to do with this, because he's got like three sentences in there, just go post that on Stack Exchange, and there's a few workarounds using open query and open row set. 
Uh, I know because I happen to use these all the time. It's beyond what I can explain quickly in a verbal answer, but open query and open row set are tricks that I use to get around building a temp table. Ooh, and if you wanted to see how we use it, open SP Blitz. Open SP Blitz and look for the word open query, all one word, uh, and I show how I, I use that to uh, build temp tables, call stored procedures, and uh, populate them into temp tables. Trivial pursuit. Uh, next question. Someone set bulk log as my recovery model. First off, I just want to say that Tara Kaiser, if she was here, would be proud of you for using the word model instead of mode, because so many people, including yours truly, keep using the word mode, trying to break that habit. I have a 6 gig database, and it has a 330 gig transaction log file. Oh, sweet potato. Holy <laughs> Wow. Uh, if I just set the recovery model to simple, will that commit the transaction so I can shrink the log file? Or do I have to do a backup of that huge file before I can shrink it? So there's a couple of different questions in here. One is about committing the transaction. The transactions can be committed. It's just that whenever you're in either full or bulk log, SQL Server is going to keep around that transaction log until you back it up. So what you could do, if the business is okay losing point in time recovery temporarily. Yeah, throw it into simple recovery model. Hear that, Tara? Model. I said it correctly. Um, throw it into simple recovery model, shrink it to the size that you want, and then turn it back into full or bulk logged, whichever you prefer. But in those full or bulk logged, then you have to start doing transaction log backups. Uh, next question What do you think is the worst feature in SQL Server? Whoa! Oh, worst feature in SQL Server. Um, oh, oh uh, query notifications. Okay, query notifications. So for me, query notifications sounded amazing when they came out because what your app could do, and I'm so totally not a developer, but what your app could do is it could connect to SQL Server, run a query, and leave the connection open and get a ping back whenever your results changed. Oh, cool. And this sounds amazing. It sounds like some kind of caching thing. It's genius. But then here's the flip of it. Your app has to leave the connection open for every query. So then suddenly you have a spectacular number of connections open against your SQL server, all just sitting there waiting to know if anything changed. And you multiply that times a whole bunch of app servers, and suddenly your SQL server starts running into connection issues. So then what people started doing in order to work around that was they would build one query that basically hit all of their tables and got all the databases that they wanted, even just a count star from several different tables to get all the rows in them so they would know whenever the number of rows change. But of course, the bigger you craft your query, the more notifications you get because people are constantly adding things to tables. So it sounded so awesome. And I bet it does solve real pains for in specific issues, but I've just seen enough people get burned by that that I, I think I would call that the worst one. Um, how about you, Richie? Shrink. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. God. Shrink. And, and it's not that it's bad. It's just that people don't know when to use it. Um, and you could really screw things up. It's just... Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's interesting that you know, people always talk about, oh, databases are going to be self-managing. Database administrators are going to be out of job. And to some extent, I think that that's true, especially you start moving towards stuff like Azure SQL DB. But Microsoft, with every new version, gives us interesting new ways to shoot ourselves in the feet. And the basic stuff like how a file size management still isn't taken, um, taken care of for you. So, Yeah, and, and, and it's true in with SQL or uh, NoSQL as well. So you have certain situations where you could really shoot yourself in the foot, even though it's super fast and super everything. Um, things could go kablooey very quickly, and when that happens, it, most most of the developers don't have the knowledge to go in there and figure out well what's going on with this particular work pattern that I'm I'm now thrashing my NoSQL DB on. Um, I sat in a, a session at uh, AWS. And they started going into that when DocumentDB starts going uh, aw aw awry. And I was like, oh, this is good. And then they went off it. I'm like, oh, this is oh, more. Come on. 
Uh, you wonder if so. I was thinking about this on the way out here. You wonder if at reInvent they're not allowed to tell stories of bad internals or problems just because it's maybe because it's a marketing conference or a, a, a Amazon owned conference. Yeah, you would. Yeah, but I mean that's when you get a deeper understanding of the product and and how to you know write your code a little bit differently. So because you know how the product works, but. We're we're weird. I'm I'm just we're we're just strange people. I, I'm just convinced of that. We're you looking know, I, for other things. There are a slew of questions piled up, but I have to ask something just because I'm curious. How many Cub shirts do you own? A lot, a lot. Yeah. Let's just say it's really increased over the past month or two. <laughs> I've. <laughs> Let's see. TempDB setup question. I've got four data files in one log file on one 30 gig drive, and I'm not allowed to move it. How much space should I leave for the log file? Uh, I love this question. I actually just divide them evenly because it's it's really hard to get a good scientific answer. So in this case, if you've got four data files, those of you listening to the podcast can't, can't see me handing up, holding up all my fingers, which are also bedazzled and covered in diamonds. That's not true. Um, so there's four data files, <laughs> and there's egg roll juice on there. Um, uh, four data files and one log file. Just divide 30 gigs by five and call it a day. Uh, is next question is dynamic SQL the best approach to deal with sometimes slow queries due to bad parameter sniffing? Parameter sniffing is one of those problems that has all kinds of different uh, solutions, and there's no one perfect solution. I'm actually a huge fan of Erlen Summerskog's epic post. See, we made it 15 minutes before I talked about her Erlen Summerskog's epic post. If you search for slow in the app, fast in SSMS, Erland has a great rundown of all the different solutions for parameter sniffing and their uh, pros and cons. I keep saying I keep saying this on every podcast, which has also made me realize I need to write that post. I need to write a post that tells the story a little differently the way that I want to tell it. Erland's post is epic, but every time I show it to someone, they see, oh my god, this has a table of contents and it's 50 pages long. <laughs> Can you just give me the TLDR? It's slow, and it's slow. fast. Option recompile. <laughs> <laughs> yes, option recompile everything. Fix it all, man. With some no locks, you'll be good. <laughs> some no locks. <laughs> <sighs> uh, let's see here. Next up, uh, I'm working towards a five-year plan for our SQL infrastructure. What are some big gotchas that you guys usually look out for when planning for the future, apart from constant Microsoft licensing changes? Oh, this is such a good question because I was just having a conversation with Tom Norman. Tom Norman runs the virtualization virtual chapter at PASS. He's a volunteer who manages a bunch of volunteer presenters who all come in and give different sessions on virtualization. And he said, hey, you want to you want to talk on in 2017? I said, you know what? I actually don't have any more virtualization talks. I don't think virtualization is the future anymore. Virtualization is just the standard. It, this is what it is, and everybody kind of has to know it. And it's just kind of table stakes. But if I'm looking down further, because like the old Gretzky saying is, you want to skate to where the puck is at, this is one of those moments where I feel really str sorry for our what? The puck is going to be. You want where to go the skate where the puck is going to be, not where the puck is at. Yes, yes. Skate to where the puck is going to be. Now, this is one of those moments where I feel really sorry for our transcriptionist. God bless you for typing this. <laughs> Gretzky is G-R-E-T-Z-K-Y. <laughs> so, you want to skate to where the puck is going, which means if I'm looking five years out, for me, it's one of two things. It's either uh, cloud, which cloud can either mean infrastructure as a service or a platform as a service, or it means containers. But those are the two, and it can mean both. You can totally run containers in the cloud. But five years out, when I plan for a SQL Server infrastructure, I would expect to be some percentage in uh, Google Cloud Compute Engine, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure. It's it's going to be there. Uh, and Richie's a great example of this. I mean, so Richie is we're building out applications and we're building out stuff for the future. Um, when you think about how you're going to choose where you store data at, what are what are the things that you think about five years out? Uh, I'm not actually thinking a, a ton of five things out, right? I mean, so is the service going to be up or not, right? So I mean, when you're talking S3 storage, 
Um, the really question is where we're going to be five years out. The really question is going to be does what I'm trying is my usage where this file where does it should where should it be? Should it be in a database? Should it be in S3? What service would be applicable to that? Um, so that's really the more the question than where we're going to be in five years. So if we're if we're going to say okay, well we're going to be in five years in the cloud, we don't have the answer for that because they're constantly changing things in the cloud. So we, we have to build for what is here today. Um, even uh, it, with the exception of we're in the beta of um, one of the database products, um, Aurora, uh, Aurora uh, for Postgres, but that is here, right? I mean, that's here now um, because we're even though we're in the beta, we could build towards that uh, because we're using it now. I can't build towards something that I don't know where it's going to be. Um, storage in the cloud, we could just buy more, and 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 that's and that's that. So um, we're not using VMs or anything like that. So we don't have to really worry about a lot of that a lot of that stuff in the cloud. So th the questions change in the cloud as opposed to um, when you're on prem. They just they're different questions that you ask. Mm -hmm. And capacity management's gotten both performance capacity and, store, and just outright, you know, storage capacity has gotten so much harder in the last you know, six to twelve months because now there's so many gotchas around what knobs you're allowed to tune up in the cloud, what knobs you can tune on premises. Um, it's really fun to watch Argenis Fernandez. He's a storage guy at Pure Storage. And the kinds of things that he talks about, how, even how the way that you test storage is so rapidly changing, even on-premises. And the, the stuff that you can do on-premises for storage is so cheap. Intel's now down to $1,000 for a 2 terabyte PCI Express drive. $1,000 for a 2 terabyte drive. Those aren't desktop class. Those are enterprise-grade PCI Express drives with sub-millisecond latency. So it's just amazing how much, how fast that's changing. And it's still at the same time, the amount of stuff that people want to shove into the database is just epic. What the kind of crap that people want to pour into there for no apparent reason. Right. That's why the question is, where does it should be? Should it be in the database or should it be somewhere else? Uh -huh. Right. And then the question is, okay, does, is this data going to be accessed frequently or infrequently? And that will even choose what data solution that we have whether that is in Aurora or in some NoSQL or in something else. So uh, you get so much flexibility in the cloud, you know, you're, and not, every, not one data platform is going to handle everything because you could very easily spin up another data platform that may handle that one use case better. And six months from now, a new option comes out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then you're like, damn it, I just got this thing working. <laughs> A uh, fellow human asks, why do you have to grant access to user-defined data types? What a weird concept. I asked last week, but I wanted Brent's point of view. You know, it's funny. I read that, I read that transcript, and I didn't know either. I don't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Like, the whole security thing is so totally – it's uh, the one thing that's in our contracts that we just totally don't touch. If you want to learn more about it, what you do is go grab the book Securing SQL Server. Securing SQL Server by Denny Cherry. Now he's now in the, I can't remember if he's in the third or fourth edition of it, but it's great, brings the subject to life, has a lot of good stuff. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Nathan says, I have another question. When Microsoft said when using a linked server, setting it up as an open TRAN pulls the info back much quicker, but it seems to truncate about 1% of the results. Any ideas? Definitely set up a repro script. Set up a repro script that you can run every time, and if it truncates 1% of the results every time, then go post it on dba.stackexchange.com, and you'll uh, be amazed at the quality of answers you get. I've never heard that problem. That's why I would say go post it, because it may totally be real. I've just never seen it. Another question, is there a database that has all of the SQL Server uh, service packs and CUs? Yes, go to SQLServerUpdates.com. SQLServerUpdates.com lists the most recent ones. And I know because I updated it this morning with 2014 Service Pack 2 Cumulative Update 3, thanks to a, an eagle-eyed reader who spotted that it had come out. And I'm like, okay, screw it. I'm on my Christmas break, but why not? Hashtag never vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Always at the keyboard. <laughs> Sounds like a good podcast that we probably will never do. <laughs> when he's not away from the keyboard. Oh, man, lots of good questions this week. Let's see. Sam asks, 
Have you ever had a scenario where an inactive or sleeping process is taking 100% CPU? If so, what steps can I use to investigate it further? I would start with SP who is active. SP who is active is Adam Mechanic's excellent stored procedure. It has a whole lot of extra parameters that you can call to say what the object has locks on, whether it's, it'll also pull back sleeping spids, all kinds of things. Now, rollback is another classic example, of course, too, that'll use 100% CPU just because something's rolling back. Oh, one person says, I'm going through an interview process for a senior DBA job. I got T-SQL questions with a data set, and the data set had lots of errors. It had two tons of duplicate records. Was this a test? Should I consider working for this company? Um... I would ask if they're if they're hiring for a developer or a DBA position because usually if I'm dealing with bad data, that's something that I hand to Richie and I say, Richie, you figure out how to make sense of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's literally that's my gig, right? I mean, as a data developer, T SQL is my my native language. It's my native tongue. I don't expect my senior DBAs to understand some of the stuff that I put out, and I don't. I don't really want them to be. I want them to be good at hardware, and I want them to be good at backups, and I want them to be good at finding uh, problems, you know, with statistics and things like that, and indexes. I don't really want them to be good at T-SQL. That's my opinion. We talk about in our in our uh, both of our classes, the senior DBA and the performance tuning class. I start out by laying out the job descriptions of what a DBA is, and I break that into production DBA versus development DBA, and then database developer, because they really are three different roles. As you grow your career, when you get started, if it touches SQL Server, you're expected to know it. But as you mature, especially when you throw the word senior in there, a senior DBA shouldn't be deduping data. Um, a senior database developer, yes, absolutely. Um, and so what, the other thing I would say is, before you say, no, I shouldn't work for this company, so it's really hard to do interviews, and sometimes people will just Google for interview questions because they don't know what to use, and they'll expect, for example, one of my clients is saying, I can't believe that none of my in job interview candidates uh, can explain the Halloween problem. And I'm like, dude, if you called me in cold and asked me to explain the Halloween problem, I don't know that I could do it under pressure in an interview either because I just don't have to deal with that. That's what the database is for. You know, I can't tell you how the suspension in my car works internally, but, you know, it's, I can still do it. I can't really do a decent job of driving. But I don't get into accidents. I haven't been in an accident. That's what Google's for, really, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, are you, am, I, am I here to answer trivia or am I here to manage databases? Why are you here? I, uh... I ask myself every day. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, oh, I love this question. Uh, another ancient history, SQL used to be able to respond to email. Can SQL Server still send and receive email, specifically receive email using database mail? Do not do this. SQL Server is the world's worst email processing software. Um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Go get a finely qualified developer, not like Richie, someone who's actually finely qualified. Yeah, he's, he's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, then, then the question is like, how much are you spending to per, per email the process? I mean, holy crap, that must be expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, so expensive. $7,000 a core, Enterprise Edition, hideous. Uh, Phil says his vote for the worst feature is XML data types. See, I, I actually, I don't know. See, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mixed about this because I don't like storing XML in the database. That's the wrong place for a relational database. But I have seen clients where they do need to dump an XML blob in there and they need to query on specific keys. And XML indexes were actually really fast. Granted, behind the scenes, it's actually turning your XML into a table and it takes a buttload of space. That's a scientific met uh, metric. And she asked me one time, what is an actual buttload? Well, she's I'm like, oh, that's, that's true. You can't really store that much stuff in your butt. But a buttload, we usually think of it as a large thing. Uh, but it, XML data types do make sense in those words. I'm not as big of a fan on JSON in the database. Okay, the so it, it's the same, right? I mean, it's the same mechanisms here. So JSON versus XML, it's just different formats, but the same underneath mechanisms. So why would you be okay with one versus the other? Because they didn't do indexes the way that they did with XML. 
Oh, okay. So the next version, when they do do the indexes correctly, then you'll be okay with it. And I bet they will, because developers want that feature so bad that. It's, again, it's one of those things. Like, yeah, on the cover, as as a as a as a as a data developer and an architect, yeah, I kind of agree with you. But there, again, there's certain things that you can in the cloud. It's different, right? XML. I'm going to shred that off in S3, and I'm done with it. Right, but you know, on-prem, eh, maybe there's a case where I may be able to put down a SQL Server and occasionally use it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that may be okay. Um, and it's been helpful in in some cases. I mean, just look at SP Blitz and stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's true. SP Blitz Cache, especially. Eric Darling's done some wonderful work shredding XML and SP Blitz Cache. Yeah, he he can't close his eyelids anymore. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> Uh, okay, we'll take one last question. There's so many good ones this week. I'm actually going to take the questions from this and do a whole separate blog post because there's so many good questions this week that we're not going to get to. Uh, but Michelle asks, and I wonder if that's how you pronounce your name, Michelle, because I have a friend of mine who's Michaela and this writes kind of the same way. Uh, again, our poor transcriptionist. How do I type the differences between... So Michaela is M-I-K, but... Uh, do you think that we database administrators should start learning NoSQL and Hadoop for the future? I think if you're a technical data professional, you should follow the things that you love. Follow the, the apps, the servers. If there's something that you go, wow, this is amazing, I really want to learn more about this, you can make a living with almost any product or technology. If you're passionate about it, it'll not seem like work. There's that cheesy quote, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. That's totally not true, but it will seem like you're working less. If you love NoSQL, go for that. If you love Hadoop, go for that. Um, But don't think that as a database administrator, you need to know how those technologies work. Even as a consultant, my best value is just to recognize patterns and say, here's where you should be using a NoSQL solution. And if so, here's the one I would recommend. And here's where you should be doing processing in Hadoop uh, rather than doing some kind of scale out processing in SQL Server. But am I the guy to implement that? Not no, but hell no. Yeah, I always kind of do like the C-level test, right? Can I hold a conversation about that technology at a C-level executive, right? M- mainly a technical C-level, like a CIO or CTO. That's kind of the inf- type of information that I want to want to be at. Maybe a little bit more, so I could add a little more value, but uh, at least so I could have that conversation with that C-level uh, executive. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the levels that I always kind of wanted to be at with the newer technology and the stuff happening around the periphery. Now, if it's something that's really, really cool and I'm really excited about, then I'm going to jump on in and do that. But with Hadoop and that NoSQL and all the flavors of thereof, you probably are going to be wasting your time unless you want your next job to be in those technologies. Mm-hmm. I when, when Postgres started catching on in the SQL Server community, I don't know, f- three, four, or five years ago, um, that I installed it on my Mac, I did Aqua Data Studio or whatever it was I was using as a front end at the time, and I played around with it. I'm like, yeah, it's a database. That's cool. Yep. And then I'm like, but what am I going to do from here? <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. If I can't Woo-hoo! personally use it on every day, then I don't really want to be uh, dig deeply into it. I want to play with it just to see, you know, oh, does it work? How does it work? You know, what, what kind of problems do they face? Same thing with MySQL. Like I would dabble in MySQL just to see how it works. But as soon as I realized, every time I dip my toes into something else, MySQL, Postgres, uh, Elastic Cache, uh, Elastic Search, all kinds of DynamoDB, I'm like, man, SQL Server is amazing. Our developer tooling is fantastic. Management Studio should be sainted. It's incredible. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. You start, you know, you're using Postgres, and you're like, I got to use this crap? What the hell is this? <laughs> I mean, damn, this is like command line versus Siri, right? I mean, this is just yeah. so manual. It's like, oh, crap. I'm a real designery look and feel kind of guy. Um, you know, says the guy with the Apple Watch and all that kind of stuff. But uh, And the Mac with the touch bar. Um, but I, I come back from using other tools, from using Postgres tools, from using MySQL tools. I come back to SQL Server, and I'm like, this is just management studio is beautiful. It's gorgeous. Yep. 
you know, yeah, sure, it doesn't look like an Apple product, but in terms of the database world, we are some of the luckiest database professionals out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree hardly. It's the same thing with Visual Studio, how I feel about Visual Studio. Oh, yes. And, yeah. And, and with its debugging capability and remote debugging and all this other crazy stuff, and once you get it going, it, it really works really well. And now I'm starting to feel the same way about code, knowing that that I've been using a lot of JavaScript and Node, and that, that's where I've kind of gravitated to is Visual Studio Code. It's really it's really powerful. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to get into. And I was a Sublime user as well, as well as an Atom one too. So um, if you haven't checked into Visual Studio Code, even just as a text editor, or a markdown editor or anything like that, you check it out. It, it, there's a lot of cool stuff in there that um, you could you could you could use. And even as a DBA, you you know, was just looking at text files and scripts and stuff like that. It's a really powerful tool. It's always funny. I read Hacker News, and it's always funny because it's a non Microsoft site for the most part. They're really big on what's the biggest framework of the day, you know, Rails, Python, whatever. And uh, whenever a Visual Studio uh, a, post comes up and people have a discussion, the the elite hacker guys will be like, I don't understand why anybody would ever use that. And there's immediately a barrage of comments like, no, seriously, you should check it out. It's it's yeah. actually <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well thanks everybody for hanging out with us this week. We will see you guys next year. Dun dun dun. Adios everybody. See ya.